the Hudson Library and Historical Society's Through the Eyes of the Artist series. Presents art historian Felicia Zavarella Stadelman. Speaking about French artist Henri Matisse, whose early paint artwork caused controversy, but his later cut paper artwork was renowned. Recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on January 18, 2016. Good evening. Welcome to the Hudson Library. Tonight continues our series of featured artists. Um, I'm pleased to see so many people came out tonight on such a cold evening. We had a lot of people registered and we kind of wondered whether everybody was going to come out because it's so cold, but thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope that you'll continue to join us. We have a lot of upcoming programs here at the library. In the back, we have a table of um, brochures and the variety of programs that we have, including music programs, author programs, and technology programs. So please feel free to pick up a brochure that has all those programs coming up before you step out tonight. Tonight, I would like to welcome back our speaker, Felicia Zavarella Stadelman, as she presents her series of artist biographical lectures through the eyes of the artist. Tonight, she's going to speak on the artist, Henry Matisse. Wow, I'm excited. You guys are out here in this freezing cold. I thought for sure we'd have an empty crowd, but I do appreciate you being here. I think that means you're wanting to get all of those cards in the entire set of 33 or whatever, right? <laughs> I knew that was the draw. Henri Matisse was born in 1869, the year the Cuddy Sark was launched. The year that he died, 1954, the first hydrogen bomb exploded. Not only did he live on, literally, fr live on from one world to the other, he lived through some of the most traumatic political events in recorded history, the worst wars, the greatest slaughters, the, the most demented rivalries of ideology without even turning a hair. He never made a moralistic painting. He never signed a manifesto. There is hardly any reference to any political event, let alone an expression of a political opinion. Nowhere in his writings, in his artwork, his studio and his canvases were a world within a world a place of equilibrium where for 60 continuous years he produced images of comfort, refuge, and balanced satisfaction. Unlike his contemporaries, nowhere in Matisse's work do we feel any trace of alienation or conflict with modernism, which was the mirror of our century, and it's so often reflected in the uh, art that we see coming out of it. His paintings are the equivalent of an ideal place scaled away from the assaults or the erosions of history. Journalists were always enthralled with Matisse. One journalist said, Matisse himself was a great surprise, for I found not a long-haired, slovenly dressed, eccentric man like I had imagined, but a fresh, healthy, robust, blonde gentleman who looked even more German than French, and whose simple, unaffected cordiality put everyone directly at ease. Many people commented on Matisse's slow, deliberate speech and his serious and reflective air. Some people thought he looked like a German professor with those horn-rimmed glasses that he liked to wear. Other people felt that his face recalled that of a scientist rather than an artist. Even when he was in art school, people called him the doctor. Many people found Matisse's mild appearance very deceptive. He's described by one friend as bearded with eyes full of mischief behind his gold-rimmed glasses. Matisse once confided in a friend that among the careers he would have liked to have had, he would have really preferred to either be a jockey or a virtuoso violinist or perhaps an actor. But his strongest characteristic, which isn't really apparent to the eye, was his ability to take risks, to drive himself to the limit. One of his models was tout or rien, all or nothing. Henri Emile Benoit Matisse was born on New Year's Eve in uh, 1869, and then as now it was a joyful holiday 
held the promise of a new uh, beginning, hope for all new things to come, and as an artist, Matisse fulfilled those expectations. Many people consider him to be the greatest innovator of the 20th century, as well as a joyful genius who created a world of great beauty and pleasure. Such a gift was not easy in a period that suffered two terrible wars, and Matisse said he needed a strength of mind to set his art of purity and balance against the difficulties and the horrors of the war. His mom's name was Anna, Anna Heloise Gerard, and she was from Cambrai, a region where Matisse was born, where these people were famous for strength of mind and persistence, and they were noted for their courage and independence as far back as Roman times. His mother's family, one of the oldest in Le Cateau, was involved in the tannery and glove making business all the way back to the 16th century. And she provided Henri an unwavering rock-like support, that the same support that she provided to her husband and her other son. Matisse later said, my mother loved everything that I did. His father sold grain and hardware and kept a pharmacy. Matisse's mother ran the section of her husband's shop that sold house paints, making up the customer's orders, advising them on color schemes, and the colors evidently left a lasting impression on Henri. He himself later said that he got his color sense from his mother, who was also an accomplished painter on porcelain, which was kind of a hobby that a lot of women did at that time. It was very fashionable to do that. And Henri was the couple's first son, so he got a great deal of attention from his mother. Now, his father was a well-off merchant, and he wanted to give his son Henri a good education with all of the trimmings, including violin lessons. Although he was a very practical man, he arranged to share the cost of the teacher by having her give lessons to Henri and his neighbor friend. When they saw the teacher coming, they would slip away, climb over the fence to the opposite person's house. By the time the teacher came around the door and looked for the boys, they had gone back over the fence to hide at another house. <laughs> at the age of 44, he wished that he hadn't done that. He had a change of heart, and he started to take violin lessons then. Matisse's father had his own ideas for his son's career. He sent him to high school for an education in the classics, and then eventually to Paris to study law. After he passed the examination with honorable mention, Matisse returned home and worked as a clerk in a lawyer's office. He said, said, I spent much of my time doing boring mechanical work, copying thick piles of, pa of files that nobody read. I did nothing, however, to change my life. Henri describes himself as a pensive child. He said, I was dreamy, frail, and not outst outstandingly bright. Not until he was 20, when he was recovering from an attack of acute appendicitis, did he really find his direction. A friend of the family encouraged him to draw while he was recuperating. Although his very serious father disapproved of this frivolous hobby, a waste of time, his mother, who kind of had this feeling for art, bought him a set of paints, two canvases, and two color photos to copy, a view of a watermill, and a riverbank uh, that had an entrance to a farm. Matisse later said, the moment I had this box of colors in my hands, I had the feeling that my life was in there, like an animal that rushes to what he loves. I plunged straight into it to the understandable despair of my father. Before that, nothing interested me. After that, I had nothing on my mind but art. He painted both copies and signed them Essetam, Matisse backwards. So I haven't seen that on the Antiques Roadshow yet, but I know somebody's <laughs> got that somewhere. We're still on the lookout. He went on to paint his own pictures, which were mostly still lives. Now Matisse knew that he wanted to paint more than anything else, but he had to get around his father's opposition. So for a year, he took drawing lessons at 6.30 every morning at the Academy Julienne before he went to the office and at six in the evening after he finished work. He's dead center there with all the people around him. Of course, this is much later uh, when he took this picture. His teacher gave him encouragement and 
and a letter of introduction to the most famous French classic painter and professor, William Bouguereau. Somehow I always manage to put my favorite picture in every presentation. Do you notice that? <laughs> it's in my hallway of my house, incidentally. His mother helped Henri work up enough courage to ask his father to send him to Paris to study painting with the promise of a small allowance, but only for a year. He had to try it out. Now, Bouguereau did not give Matisse very much encouragement. He told this aspiring young student, you don't know perspective and he refused to learn the basics from Bouguereau. As a result, he didn't thrive in his class. When Matisse failed all of his courses at L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts, France's leading art school, he was cut from his monthly allowance, and his father said he could start saving his own money or he can get by without it. Luckily, he found another teacher, Gustave Moreau, and he came upon him uh, and Moreau invited him to join his studio. So instead of this rule-bound Bouguereau, Matisse had a teacher who was not concerned with rules or academic approval. He wanted Henri to develop his own style. Now, early uh, on, when he was studying with Moreau, his father came to visit him in Paris and gave him a real scare. He said, I broke out into a cold sweat after waking up early one morning to see my father standing in front of my studies and my drawings, which he had lined up in front of him as if he was trying to judge their worth. He also had an interview with Moreau, uh, Matisse's father, who, of course, assured him of his talent as his father was handing him the money for the private lessons. <laughs> However, Matisse was soon able to reassure his father with a different kind of success. This particular painting called Woman Reading was bought for the residence of the President of France after being exhibited with four other works at the very prestigious Salon, which is that great glass-roofed exhibition hall where all of the artists wanted to have their work displayed in hopes that someone would buy their work. Now, this kind of success was what most students from L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts dreamed of, and Matisse presented this painting with much approval for the Salon. It's a realistic rendition of an interior, and it shows a very delicate interplay between light and shadow. Interestingly, Matisse places a self-portrait on the wall above the cupboard, which suggests kind of a silent dialogue between the artist and the model. The woman is Caroline, his companion, and the mother of his daughter, Marguerite, who was born a year before. Only six years after that box of colors set him on this hard war row uh, towards a career in painting, the 26-year-old artist saw an opening that would give him public acclaim, financial success, honors and awards, and of course his father would continue paying for his studies. But he didn't follow it. Instead, he was feeling restless, dissatisfied with the work that was accepted, and so he escaped that summer to Brittany, and he went with a man who had a studio next door to him. His neighbor was a much more avant-garde painter than Matisse. He knew about the independent artists who were called the Impressionists. He was starting himself to use Impressionist color, this young painter, and all of the young painters were starting to infuse color into their work. And Matisse's neighbor brought him to the coast of Brittany because there was an artist colony there that had been established by an Australian painter by the name of John Peter Russell. Does anybody recognize that name? If you were paying attention to earlier lectures, you might know him. He was an absolute unknown uh, then as well. He was an Impressionist painter who was a friend of Claude Monet and a very close friend of another painter, Vincent Van Gogh, you're supposed to chime in and let me know you're paying attention. <laughs> now, just a little aside, it was, um, Van, it was a Russell who first went to the south and painted the Mediterranean and came back and showed his pictures to Van Gogh, who was very much impressed. This was around 1887. Van Gogh painted irises and sunflowers, and most importantly, the cafe at night around this time. And Van Gogh went to Arles the following year and invited Gauguin to join this com community of artists sharing the idea of color. And Van Gogh hoped that this would be the beginning of an artist cooperative that he had dreamed of.
Now, John Peter Russell, who was a very good friend of Vincent van Gogh and painted that portrait of him when he met him, not the emaciated man with, you know, red short hair and a bandage on his ear, but a healthy, attractive young van Gogh who had just met Russell at the time. And John Peter Russell believed in everything that Vincent van Gogh was doing. So he wanted to create the studio in the north while van Gogh was creating the studio in the south, this cooperative of artists all focused on infusing their canvases with color. He begged Van Gogh to come and join him, but he couldn't afford the prices that uh, you needed to live in Brittany at the time, so he settled in Arles. Uh, John Peter Russell went to Brittany to show him how things were going, and Russell kept a number of paintings that Van Gogh sent him, which were these paintings that you see here, owned by uh, John Peter Russell. Russell may, remains on the island. He cut himself off from the art world and he painted as an impressionist, which was they were eventually called the expressionists. He reached his peak around 1896, which is right around the time that Henri Matisse arrives on the island. He's an unknown star, uh, artist. He had heard about what John Peter Russell was doing. And Matisse gets a painting by Vincent van Gogh who was already gone by then, and it had opened up to Matisse New Horizons. This was 1896, six years after Vincent van Gogh had committed suicide. Matisse was 27, and now he's seeing the work for the first time of Vincent van Gogh. Matisse said, my initial reaction was horror. I saw these paintings that Russell was painting, and I was absolutely shocked. He said, I felt as though the earth had given away beneath my feet. Now, he had never actually looked at an Impressionist canvas before, but this new version of Impressionism called Expressionism was kind of like the end of the world to him, and he fled for 10 days. He said, I simply couldn't stand it anymore. He goes back and has a meeting with Pierre Renoir to talk about this idea of color. But the following year, he comes back as Russell's pupil, and this was Matisse's launch as a painter. He had a long way to go. It was the beginning. He was painting some ast astonishing work that year. He abandoned that clay-colored palette and he began to color and use the work of this new expressionist group, um, John Peter Russell and, and Vincent van Gogh. Russell gave him one of the 12 van Gogh paintings that he had and Matisse never gave any one of those to anyone else. Matisse always claimed Russell and Van Gogh were my teachers. They explained color theory to me. To Matisse, he said the style of Van Gogh was the road worth following. Instead of those subdued interiors that the salon wanted, he was going to paint light-filled seascapes with these bold, bright colors. To this point, he was only doing still lifes, everything the salon wanted. Tentatively, he always had this dark palette, uh, trying to imitate the traditional style of art and that dark palette was supposed to raise the nobility of painting. So Matisse comes back from his visit with John Peter Russell being influenced by Vincent van Gogh, the inspiration of the colors, and he comes back with these paintings that absolutely appalled everyone. He had a terrific argument with his teacher at L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts, Gustave Moreau. He was clearly influenced by the Expressionists. They were hated at the time by the classical artists, but worse yet, his friends, who you might have expected would have believed in him, thought that he was going mad because of the paintings that he was creating. He said it was the most isolated moment of his whole life, the lowest moment of his career. Now, Moreau had no love for Impressionism. Expressionism were kind of the anti-Impressionists at the time. Um, he did defend this one painting by saying this about the dinner table. The decanters are solidly placed on the table so that I could actually hang my hat on one of the stoppers. That was the compliment he gave to this painting. Now, Moreau always managed to bypass the issue of style. He taught his uh, students that what was important for an artist was not just line but color. And he urged his students not to be content with copying masterpieces in museums, but to go out into the street, learn how to capture quickly the essence of a passerby in just a few strokes. And he gave his students exercises in which color became more important. So it was kind of surprising that he was shocked when he saw the work of Matisse.
He told them, paint as quickly as possible without a preliminary drawing in order to keep your color fresh. If you have no imagination, you'll never do beautiful color. The color must be thought, dreamed, and imagined. That's exactly what Matisse was putting on the canvas. That year, Matisse came under the wing of another mentor, the Impressionist Camille Pissarro who also had advice for the young painter. He said, don't proceed by the rules or principles. Paint what you observe and feel. Paint generously and unhesitatingly. It's best not to lose your first impression. Don't be timid in front of nature. One must be bold at the risk of being deceived and making mistakes. One, ha one must have only one master, nature. And they didn't mean grass and trees and leaves. They meant nature, what you feel. That's the only thing that should be consulted, he told him. So b for both Pissarro and Matisse, uh, it meant this direct and intense feeling of what you saw. Now the road that Matisse continued to travel on took him further and further away from the possibility of academic or financial success or any security. At the same time, he meets a young woman named Emily, and they had two sons over the next couple years. Emily opened a Milner's shop to support the family, but sometimes they had so little money that they had to take their children to stay with relatives. Madame Matisse was very loyal to her husband. She played a fundamental role in his life and his career for more than 40 years because she was the primary bed, bread, bread uh, winner at the time. When it came to art, Matisse kept his strength of mind and persistence by following what he believed in, keeping those Van Gogh paintings, uh, talking with Camille Pissarro. Um, he bought a painting of Paul Cezanne that he said later sustained me morally in the critical moments of my venture as an artist. I always draw on these paintings my faith and my perseverance. He refused to sell any of these paintings, even when he was desperate for money, because the paintings meant more to him, just as his own style meant a lot to him as well. He wanted to discover or uncover within himself a new pictorial language, and he knew that it meant a lifetime of working and searching and experimenting. Later in life, after his efforts brought him financial security on his own terms, he told an American journalist, do tell the American people that I'm a normal man, I'm a devoted husband and father, I have three fine children, I go to the theater, ride horseback, I have a comfortable home, a fine garden that I love, just like any other man. He was always in search of what felt right in his art. And he traveled to a number of different places. They went to London to study the work of the English painter, Joseph William Turner, who filled his paintings with vivid colors and vibrant light. A month later, he and his wife and family set out for Corsica, where they stayed for six months. The bright sun of the Mediterranean awakened in Matisse. He said, a, a desire, desire to fill my canvases with, with pure, bright color. When he returned home, he painted several uh, canvases using various colors of red and green and yellow. His room was always cold. He would never put firewood into the stove because he felt that the ashes would cover the fruit in his paintings and dim their color. Now, almost every innovative artist of the 20th century had created art that shocked the public and drew scorn and abuse from the art establishment. And Matisse's turn came in 1905, when at the age of 36, he exhibited 10 paintings at the Salon d'Automne. At the center of the storm was this painting called Woman with a Hat. It was a portrait of his wife, Emily. It was a portrait like no one had ever seen before. You can recognize that it's Emily, but she has an emerald green nose, orange neck, reddish brown hair, yellow cheeks, and overwhelmingly intense and seemingly absurd colors that look like they're smeared on the canvas. One art critic said, with evident pleasure, but no regard for the usual concerns of a portrait painter. And this painting unnerved his contemporaries. Then this one was displayed, Blue Nude. 
a fiercely distorted picture of Emily reclining in a sunlit glade uh, beneath these uh, palm fronds. It seemed grotesque and ob obscene, one art critic said, when it was first shown in 1907, even to Matisse's faithful supporters, the young American critics who were anxious to see what he was doing, they said it kind of felt like a punch between the eyes. All of his life, incidentally, Matisse drove his models as well as himself to the limits of endurance. He insisted that it was better to risk ruining a painting than to be satisfied with some kind of a surface likeness. He said, it's always necessary to force your whole being beyond the stage, he told to his daughter, Marguerite, because it's only then that you start to make discoveries and you tear yourself apart in the process. That dedication and persistence, pay, Matisse paid with that, uh, with insomnia, panic attacks. He was never able to be satisfied with anything that he could do. The models were generally exhausted, sometimes a little mutinous. They uh, often were apprehensive, especially in the early years when they had to come to term with the fact that if they were going to be a model for Matisse, that would go along with public ridicule. And they had their own private misgivings about giving themselves to Matisse uh, on the canvas. Emily, his wife, would weep in distress when she would see the paintings that uh, were made of her, especially this one. I'm sorry, um, I'm a little, let me step back a little, I skipped Greta. Um, one of Matisse's students and a model was horrified because most of the time her features were discolored and her limbs were distorted on Matisse's canvas. This is the painting that Emily was uh, unhappy about. It, those stony black eyes and that mask-like gray face, it actually caused her to think twice about whether she wanted to be a model for her husband any longer. It took courage to pose for the extraordinary portra portraits that Matisse did. Um, these are the famous um, uh, portraits that were ridiculed uh, in the public eye. The girl with the green eyes, uh, the um, girl in green, and the, and the Algerian girl were always noted for their grotesque look, their gazing, confident gaze. But that frank body language of this uh, of these young women was women were so different than um, this century was able to understand. They speak to us directly today, but back then their contemporaries saw very little in these portraits that were meaningful. They were jumbles of outlines with ugly black brush strokes is how they were described. The sitters, including uh, the painter's then teenage daughter, Marguerite, who was always one of his favorite models, would actually argue with Matisse, uh, and they, he would have to pay them a great deal of money and make them a lot of promises before they would sit for him. The one who was probably the most professional model was Lulu Browdy. And she was a friend of Matisse's, amused the children. She was company for uh, Emily. She took swimming lessons from Henri. That was one of the things he had to pay her um, to teach her how to swim in order for her to sit with him. And she was kind of a typical Parisian, earthy, tough. Uh, she had dark hair cat-like features. He described her as having a, a tan so rich that he would call her the Italian sunset. And the pictures that he painted of Brody startled everyone, including the painter himself. The government minister and his wife bought this one called A Seated Nude that he, they said actually made them scream out loud the first time they saw it. He said, we came across the strange little canvas, something gripping, unheard of, fright, frighteningly new, something that frightened the maker himself, obviously, on harsh pink ground, flaming against dark blue shadows, reminiscent of Chinese or Japanese masters, was this seated figure of a violet-colored woman. We stared at it. We were stupefied. We had to have it. Now, this body of work pointed the way to a new visual language that would lead eventually to the somber, powerful, uh, semi-abstract works that 
he eventually created later on. His reputation as a modernist leader was built on the sort of shock that he created with the paintings that I just showed you. All of these paintings were exhibited at the, the independent uh, Salon of the Independence with a number of other Impressionist artists. Remember, they were rejected from the Salon and they decided to exhibit their own work um, under the bankroll of Mary Cassatt, incidentally. Um, and even these paintings that Matisse did uh, sparked off controversy. The group was ironically labeled les fauves, or the wild ones, the savage beasts in literal translation. And Henri Matisse became the reluctant leader, the young rebel artist of les fauves, who brought modern art, the modern art movement, right into the center of Paris. An art critic wrote about this exhibition, a pot of paint has been flung into the face of the public. Another art critic said, Monsieur Matisse is one of the most robustly gifted of today's painters. He could have obtained easy bravos, but instead he prefers to drive himself to undertake passionate experiments. Now these experiments, which led to fauvism, uh, which uh, were reminiscent of the time that he spent in Saint-Tropez in this Mediterranean port, were viewed by Paul Signat and George Seurat, who were the leaders of the neo-impressionists. And they ins were inspired by the works of Matisse. And it helped; these paintings helped them to develop this elaborate theory of painting that involved covering canvases with thousands of separate mosaic-like dots of pure color that were meant to merge optically. Now, art historians are always, always arguing about whether Matisse inspired Paul Signat and George Seurat, or George Seurat and Paul Signat inspired Matisse. But um, I, I, I maintain that a lot of the work that Matisse did after he saw uh, George Seurat's work changed very dramatically. He found their technique very mechanical. He felt that it had a dryness or a lack of feeling, but he did experiment with the technique and then modified it into his own style of using large areas of pure color with brief strokes, and he rejected the idea of mixing colors optically like they, they believe that as well, and he just put the colors directly from the palette on the canvas. Canvas. Now, Moreau had always told his students, use the simplest means in order to express your feelings more directly, and that's what Matisse predicated his work on, simplifying his paintings. And his paintings explode with this rebellious energy of the new century. Now, he was not alone in his desire to free the colors from what he said were the shackles of convention, allowing them to burst forth into full brightness and vigor. Many other young artists worked towards the same goal, and because they were inspired by Matisse and used this simple form, they were all referred to as the Fauvists. Each way um, they used color a little differently according to their own personality. These are Matisse's works, and this is work of some of the other artists who were considered the Fauvists. Most of the public and most critics and other artists had negative reactions to Matisse's work and the work of the Fauvists. They wrote, Matisse has done more harm in a year than an epidemic. One uh, art critic said, Matisse causes insanity. Fortunately for Matisse, there were a few collectors who were bold enough to buy his work. The Stein family, for example, in San Francisco, Gertrude and her brother were the first ones to start collecting Matisse's work. Another admirer was the young Picasso, Pablo Picasso. Matisse was 12 years older than um, Picasso. He met Picasso around 1906, and although their initial meeting was not especially cordial, they had an intense relationship of mutual respect and a professional exchange that developed later. Picasso considered his own artistic brilliance to have few equals. Picasso once said this about Matisse, all things considered, there is only one Matisse, which is a compliment coming from Picasso. 
Henri Matisse's approach to art provided a certain amount of stimulation to Picasso's creative thought. Those are Picasso's words, but they hadn't shared their view of the essence of art, Picasso said. Matisse was decorative. Picasso was about form. Picasso was about dissonance and fragmentation. Matisse was about harmony and unity of color. There are some opposites that are obvious, but the reality was much more complex. Matisse described his relationship with Pablo Picasso this way. Our differences were amicable. Sometimes, strangely, our points of view met. Picasso and I were in one another's confidence. We mutually gave one another a great deal in those exchanges. We cared passionately about our selective technical problems. And there, are, there is no question that we each benefited from each other. Now, these artists very often paraphrased each other's work. You can see it in a number of images, and there's, there's a number of them. Um, many of these copies were actually meant to be mockeries or to get their fellow artists out of a, a low point in their career and to, to get them going again. Such an adversarial beginning might have set other artists on separate tracks, but this was not the situation between Picasso and Matisse. They saw their mutual creativity inspired by the other, and they exchanged a very long friendship. They even exhibited their work together in a number of galleries. Matisse and Picasso emerged as artists of great powers, but sections of the academic world never really called it a great power. They called the combination of Matisse and Picasso not art, but a dangerous and infectious disease. Uh, some people call them friends. Uh, they were more acquaintances. They respected each other. I don't think they really went out for drinks together. Um, history, you know, likes to talk about a lot of propaganda, like Vincent Van Gogh cutting off his ear, which we know isn't true, right? Um, there's a lot of things about the battle, the fights, the arguments between Picasso and Matisse. They never argued. They just inspired each other. They, they reflected on their own artwork and they were inspired by the mutual respect they had for each other. Uh, let me give you another aside. Uh, in the late 1920s, when Matisse was declared a has-been, Picasso provoked the older artist by pa uh, painting his own version of all of Matisse's paintings. Eventually, Matisse painted with this renewed vigor and inventiveness as though he was stimulated in some way by Picasso. Comparing the two artists' work during this time, you find a bit of a conversation suggesting that they interpreted similar subjects into their own styles. One example is The Dream by Matisse, undeniably a reference to Picasso's painting, Woman with the Yellow Hair. They were often seen in public events together. They fr frequently met in private, but it was really only an exchange of works of art and ideas. Now, there's a little known true story about Henri Matisse in which the French painter walks into a cafe and when all the patrons stand up to applaud him, he turns to one of his friends and said, oh, they think I'm Picasso. Now, Matisse had gone south in 1917 in search of the sun to help cure his bronchitis, and he fell in love with the silvery light and the tropical plants, the trees that grew in the area. It reminded him of Morocco, and he eventually adopted Nice as his home base. He quickly fell into a routine that included, besides long sessions of paintings, practicing the violin, in his bathroom, he said, so as not to disturb his neighbors, and he was, would visit and receive friends. He moved several times from one hotel to another, and then eventually to this villa. At one time, an art historian uh, wrote about the fact that he observed over 300 birds that Matisse kept in a single room. Blackbirds, pigeons, parakeets, rare species. Um, he said, in seclusion, animals remind me how endlessly diverse nature was and how insistent on its life. As much as Matisse loved animals, he never put them into his paintings, especially the birds. What interested me most, he said, is neither a still life or a landscape, but simply the human figure. 
Now, it was around this time that he began a series of paintings of women, nude or either embellished with scarves, mantillas, fabrics, costumes, hats, and this group became known as the Odalisques. Now, I've done these art lectures for 20-some years, and I started out doing them in elementary schools, and I would talk about the artist, do a little project, and then we would do a project about, uh, to help us remember something about the artist. And of course, I always included the Odalisques. Little did I know that an Odalisque was a prostitute. <laughs> Until one mother came up to me and said, honestly, this is the best you could do for first grade? <laughs> so we changed the name of them as Lounging Princesses. <laughs> Of course, they never gave them nudes. That's just for you. That's why we draw the crowds, I think. His paintings were always of these good-looking women, transparent tops, harem pants, lounging around on these cushioned divans. Uh, he explains the Odalisques were the bounty of a happy nostalgia, a lovely, vivid dream of enchanted days and nights of the Moroccan climate. I felt an irresistible need to express that ecstasy, that divine unconcern in corresponding color rhythms of sunny figures, patterns, and colors. This is when he turned to another model of his, a very famous model of his, Lorette, the Italian model. There was nothing very alluring about this Italian woman. In his first painting of Lorette, he painted her with these hollow cheeks, stick-like bare arms, a cheap flimsy blouse, but this geometric construction and the black lines and curves somehow, he said, touched the misery of this sad and mistrustful hired model. Eventually, he dressed her in outfits, hoping that she would somehow be happy, and that's why he was a little inspired to have her as one of the Odalisques. The Italian woman was the last of a series of canvases where he had stripped down painting into its purest form up to this point. He was now restless. He was ready to throw off all of the constraints of abstraction. It was at a point when Lorette's uh, professional training as a model kicked in and started liberating both of them. Now, she adored dressing up, switching from this waif-like innocence to this sumptuous abandon. She seemed to change her mood with every um, uh, outfit that she put on, and she tried on a number of costumes, and that's where the Odalisques started to blossom with the ideas of Lorette. He responded to her lead as spontaneously, he said, as a dancer taking to the floor. And he painted her energetically from odd angles and strange perspectives. Um, he said, improvising endlessly her inventive rhythmic variations. The central theme was always her strong featured, her heart-shaped face and her black hair. Their relationship set a pattern for future partnerships with models of which he took this kind of an obsessive, intimate look that was played out on canvas. He painted Lorette the most, uh, around 150 times over the next 12 years. Now, it was over a year before he found anyone to take Lorette's place in uh, this province town of Nice where he lived. The prospective models were so rare that painters would actually wait in line for their services. Antoinette was the next model that inspired him. She was 19, pale, slender, she had worldly tastes, and she had this inborn sense of French chic. He responded to her love of style with a hat that he made himself from a, made from a cheap straw base, but it had white ostrich plumes curling over the brim. She wore this new hat with a style that made her simple white housecoat almost seem like a ball gown. Daily painting sessions alternated with hours and hours devoted to drawing and sketching and eventually to the painting. Matisse set himself on an almost impossible task of concentrating on simplicity, and he forced himself to work without, in the simplicity, without sacrificing uh, the, se the texture, um, sensual texture of fur, feathers, fabric. He was one of the artists that put that kind of uh, visceral feeling into his paintings. He returned over and over again to lace. Uh, drawing it in every little detail. He would say each mess, almost each mesh, 
almost every thread. He had it heart by heart so that he could translate it uh, into an ornamental arabesque without losing the character of lace, um, particularly embroidery. The same process was uh, repeated over and over, and the energy pulses between the lines that he created and the letters that he wrote home to the people who were now starting to be impressed with his work, he said, I sleep and I work and I have finally succeed, uh, succeeded at narrowing my existence down to painting alone. Now, for the public, the quality of Matisse's pictures at this stage was more or less completely obscured by the lifestyle that they depicted. This painting called French Window at Nice shows the young girl with bare legs, long, loose hair, scarlet harem pants, and she's seated beside his bed. He often used his bedroom as his studio. Um, he wasn't like many of the other artists. He didn't take advantage of his models, incidentally, like um, Gustav Klimt, for example, who wore the, wore the robe with nothing under it at all in case he had some inspiration. <laughs> the same seems to have been true for the models. Um, they would sprawl around in these harem costumes, but they were more excited about the clothing that they were wearing rather than the look that they possessed. Antoinette was his third model who made a dramatic impact on his group of odalisque paintings. She was an extra working on a film when Matisse spotted her, and he liked her natural dignity, the graceful way that he said her head sat upon her neck, and the fact that her body caught light like a sculpture. He said she was more of a ballet dancer and a musician, and she became part of his family. She actually worked for Matisse. His wife was very fond of her, and he taught her how to paint. She eventually, like Suzanne Valadon and Pierre Renoir, eventually became a painter on her own. Uh, her name was Antoinette Arnaud. He said it was essential to find the pose that any, comfortable, that any model felt comfortable and then go from there. Her specialty was discovered by accident um, after she had attended a carnival party that was attended by Matisse and his daughter, and she was dressed as an Arab princess, kind of a beauty from the harem. All of the models now tried on these turbans and embroidered Moroccan tops. Um, they wore their street clothes in, but they wore these blouses and low slung pants without inhibition when they were modeling for Matisse. He called them luxuriant, sensual, and calmly authoritative paintings. The pictorial possibilities opened up for Matisse uh, were uh, evident in his in exceptional sensitivity and his stamina to paint the same kind of painting over and over. He saw the work that he created with his models as a complex orchestration of colored light and mass culminating into this um, combination of paintings that would be the bulk of his career up to this point. The paintings were, he called them a riot of exuberant wallpaper, flowers, fruit, pattern textiles, and he pinned them firmly in place with the models. Many of Matisse's critics were taken back by the odalisques and they called them easy and charming. They also accused Matisse of having reached the end of his development with these paintings. Others understood that Matisse was only mining his talents in a different vein. One of the art critics called Matisse's odalisques obedient instruments on which he was playing a refined song. He continued working on a series of bright decorative paintings featuring models in costumes, Romanian blouses, Persian robes. They all sat by flowers and plants and fruit. One art critic said he's given in, he's calmed down. He's trying to get the public on his side. He wrote a disgusting uh, critique about the work, uh, particularly this one. Oops, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, the Odaliske in Red Culottes. Do I not have that one in here? Hang on, it might be next. Nope, I don't. 
I'll have to put that one in, I apologize. Um, this art critic's uh, view of Matisse at this stage was that he thought he was being frivolous, a decorative, uh, lightweight. He would set the tone of his work, but little did he know that he was setting the tone of his work for years to come. Matisse did not protest that his Odalisque paintings were easy. He set out to do uh, chromatic experiments. Now, another art critic kind of set the pace for the people who were interested in buying these portraits. He said, these are sexy pictures for rich men's Manhattan apartments and villas in the south of France. Matisse himself knew perfectly well that the erotic charge that came from these passionate paintings was coming from straightforward interpretation of color and style and pattern. It was the painting itself, he said, that seduced him over and over again with a fresh canvas. At an old age when he was too weak to stand by the easel all day and feared that he was going blind because he had flirted with color for too long, he branched out into the decorative arts. There's the red culottes. I knew I had that one in there. This was the painting that inspired the critic to say it was just for rich men's apartments. He then branched out into the decorative arts and he did tapestry, uh, vases, ornamented um, pl uh, place, uh, placeware, and also scenery and costumes for the ballet. Meanwhile, ominous events were taking place in Nazi Germany that even touched Matisse in his peaceful garden in Nice. The Nazis had decided that all forms of modern art were, in their words, dangerous for the spiritual health of the country, and they removed Matisse's works from German museums along with the art of other modern outstanding artists like Gauguin, Van Gogh, Picasso, Chagall, and Kandinsky, as, as well as others. And they put all of these paintings together in an exhibition and they called it degenerate art. Ironically, it was the most widely attended cultural event on the continent. Some of Matisse's paintings were put up for sale at auction. Many important art dealers were Jewish and they decided to boycott the auction in protest. The boycott was successful. Many of the works went unsold. So Nazi authorities spitefully confiscated many of the pictures and destroyed the rest. Two months later, German troops invaded Poland, setting off World War II. Less than a year later, France fell to the German armies, and Pierre Matisse urged his father to flee. Now, Matisse had been invited to go to the U.S., to San Francisco, to teach. And when he was preparing to leave, he reached the Spanish border, and he said, I saw an inex inexhaustible stream of refugees. And that's where he changed his mind. He explained later to Pierre in a letter, when I saw everything in such a mess, I had them reimburse my ticket. I realized that I should have felt like a deserter. If everyone who is worth anything runs away, what will remain of our country? So he returns to Nice. Now Lydia Delectoriskaya, who was 22 years old, a Russian immigrant, was now hired as a model and studio assistant while Matisse, in his late 60s, was now painting a mural called Dance. By her own account, she said, I could hardly have been more different from the dark-haired, dark-eyed, black-haired, uh, dark olive-skinned southern types that he had preferred up until now. She came from Siberia. She had long, golden hair, blue eyes, white skin, finely cut features. Matisse said she looked like an ice princess. She was born in 1910, the only child of a doctor who she adored, and she had been orphaned and forced to flee Russia in the turmoil after the 1917 revolution, and she wound up penniless in Nice. She was surviving on nothing but her pride and her resourcefulness uh, when in 1932 she found some temporary work as a studio assistant and then eventually as a domestic for Henri Matisse and his wife Emily. She also became Emily's companion. In addition, she took on the responsibility of overseeing Matisse's studio as well as his life. Theirs was a working alliance. There was no question of adultery. He never was with Henri Matisse. He was in love with his wife. He wrote her love letters very often. 
But this hiring this model precipitated a crisis in Matisse's marriage, and he was faced with an ultimatum. His wife said, it's me or her. Well, he sacked Lydia right away. There was no choice. He wanted his wife, but it was too late. And Emily was still furious over what she viewed as his betrayal, and she left her husband in 1939. Uh, she walked out on him after 31 years of marriage. He felt that his family no longer had faith in him or his talent or his paintings because they were all one and the same. He then rehired Lydia and she tirelessly supported all of his efforts and stayed by his side for 20 years. Uh, it was not for another three years that he actually painted her. She thought of him as being kindly and polite. He never pawed at her, she said, or asked her to do anything inappropriate. The first paintings that he made of her, he combined his phenomenal virtuosity that had cost him so many years to protect with his original instinctive ability to compose spontaneously in color. His son Pierre told his father that he had renewed himself as a painter when he saw this painting called Pink Nude, for which Lydia modeled over a period of six months. In 1941, Matisse had a close brush with death. He suffered from a chronic intestinal discomfort, and he eventually went to Lyons for what he thought would be a simple operation and no real danger. His problem turned out to be stomach cancer. Before undergoing a risky operation, he wrote an anxious letter to his son Pierre saying, I love my family, truly, dearly, and profoundly, and in the event of my death, I hope to make some peace with Emily. She never forgave him. He wrote another letter to his son, my operation was a tremendous upset. They say here that I came out of it somewhat miraculously. He fell seriously ill. Lydia knew that he was on borrowed time and she kept his studio running. She knew that it was the only way to keep this artist alive. He came to know her, everything about her, like his own heart, he said, like the alphabet. And the collaboration that they established together gave Lydia a new sense of power and purpose. She added to the duties of studio manager, um, the uh, position of principal model. Uh, painting became a central core of her life with Matisse's. Visitors to his studio never tired of speculating how the beautiful uh, secretary known as Madame Lydia might have tempted Henri Matisse. But they did, what they didn't know was that his survival depended on her, both as a man and as, and as an artist. Lydia was with Matisse all of the time. She comforted him through his illness and recovery, and she prolonged his artistic activity for another two decades. She even helped him write letters to Emily, hoping that someday she would come back. His recovery was perilous. Some traveling blood clots forced him to lie perfectly still and wait in his bed for three months. So he was compelled to remain in his bed for much of the day. He busied himself with drawing. He used a piece of charcoal at the end of a stick to draw on the walls to get some ideas. He made numerous variations in pencil or pen. In all, he created 17 groups of drawings, and then he worked on a number of books and illustrations. He composed a book called Jazz. In this book, he wrote poetry, and he made the illustrations in this book vivid with intense tones by cutting out little shapes from painted papers that he said was inspired by the improvisational spirit of jazz. And these are some of his cutouts. Now, about 20 years ago, I did this art program uh, with Matisse for some elementary schools in the Cleveland school system. And when I did Matisse, modifying it from the odalisques, we did these cutouts. And I would give all of the kids colored paper, and they would uh, give me whatever shape they could put together. And on a big canvas that I put against the wall, which was just rolled paper, I would glue these pieces together, and it would eventually become a composition like something under sea or on the moon or and they would write about it and talk about it one school in cleveland a school that's no longer there but this this was up for the longest time the art teacher converted their mural into ceramics and it was embedded into the walls and the 
uh, program continued on in the Cleveland schools with the generous support of a number of businesses around the area who paid my very small fee at the time. Um, a, a lot of kids are very inspired by Matisse. If you have children or grandchildren, give them scissors and cutouts and you can imagine what they come up with. Um, he was compelled to remain in bed, so he called this new method drawing with scissors. And he found it greatly liberating because he said, um, this cutout paper allows me to draw in color. For me, it's a matter of simplification. Instead of drawing the contour and then filling it in with color, one modifying the other, I draw directly in color. And that simplification generates the precision and the union between the two modes of expression, which become one. Now, can you see the uh, horse, the horsewoman, and the clown? The clown has a plume coming from his hat, and of course, the skirt of the horsewoman is uh, on the pink horse. They are extraordinary, these cutouts. Only a few years earlier, he was totally discouraged, and he had lamented to Picasso, my drawing and my painting are separating. Now, he writes to Picasso, cutouts gave me a way to put them back together. The technique of cutouts helped him to realize his last great project, which was creating decorations for the Dominican Chapel of the Rosary in a small town near Nice. Now, in 1942, he hired a nurse, a young refugee by the name of Monique Bourgeois, and she not only changed his bandages, but she read to him at night when he couldn't sleep, and he and Lydia became attached to her and eventually paid for her medical studies. Monique ended up becoming a doctor and then a nun. And on a visit to Matisse in 1947, she told him that her community was going to enlarge and rebuild their small chapel. And for four years, Matisse wrote to the Archbishop of Nice to humbly present his work to the Chapel of Rosary, a work that had consumed his being. And from the years of 1948 to 1951, he worked tirelessly on plans for this chapel. It was a culmination of his long artistic trajectory. It was the first time that a painter had entirely designed every detail of the chapel in a comprehensive way. And it remains a manifestation of Matisse's artistic sensibility and a culmination of his mature years. He designed all of the decorations from the stained glass windows and ceramic murals to the bronze crucifix. He worked out all the detail, including the carpeting, tile roof, wrought iron crosses, the robes that the priests wore. It turned out to be the most complete joining of art and architecture. While he himself was not religious, his feeling for art and the ancient traditions, uh, he had a deep respect for the 2,000 years of ancestors' faith, and he wanted to combine that into a special atmosphere. He said, I want those who enter my chapel to feel purified and delivered from their burdens. He told the nuns, we shall have a chapel where all can experience hope. Whatever sins a person carries with them, he can leave them at the door the way the Muslims leave the dust of the roads together with their sandals at the doors of a mosque. After finishing the chapel, he made several magnificent cutouts. He found in them this ultimate method. This 80-year-old artist often had paper fixed to the ceiling, and at night when he couldn't sleep, he would draw on a piece of it, and in the morning his assistants would cut them up. In the last decade of his life, following repeated debilitating surgeries, his eyesight also failing, he was so weak that he really couldn't get out of bed. He adjusted uh, to this condition by moving sheets of paper on panels that they would move on the sides of his canvas, uh, on the sides of his bed, large canvas panels. His extraordinary creativity was not dampened for long. He called this part of his life un second vie, un second vie. A second life, uh, that's what he called the last 14 years of his life. The work was necessarily abstract. No more could he create the intricate, flat interior designs, the two-dimensional painting figures that had been part of his flamboyant style. Uh, he was he created this lush, rigorous color. The cutouts are probably the most admired and influential works of Matisse's entire career, and they belong with the grandest affirmations of a life force of modern Western art. 
His new lease on life led to uh, an extraordinary burst of expression. He said, I had all the time I needed to reach this stage, and this is where I want to stay. By maneuvering these scissors through the prepared sheets of painted paper, he inaugurated a new phase of his career. He said, what I create constitutes my real self, free, liberated, and the experimentation offered him uh, innumerable opportunities to fashion a new, pleasing environment in which he lived. He said, I created a little garden around me where I can walk in my mind. He reinvented color in painting, and by now, he said, I found simplicity in my decoration. I have a mastery of it. At 83, he donated 100 of his works that were valued at $14 million to his hometown of Lucato, where his mother was from. In the closing decade of his life, in the face of exhaustion and failing health, Lydia made it possible for him to produce his final masterpieces, the Chapel of the Rosary and his colored paper cutouts generally agreed to be among the greatest inventions of the 20th century. He died on November 3rd, 1954. He was 84 years old. The day before, Lydia had come to his bedside with her newly washed hair wound up in a turban towel, accentuated with the purity and profile that he loved and very often drew and painted. He sketched her with ballpoint pen, holding the last drawing that he ever made out at arm's length as if to assess its quality before he said, it will do. The papers wrote, death came swiftly to the aged artist who had been a semi-invalid since undergoing a serious operation in 1940. After Matisse's death in 1954, Picasso said, I feel alone in the art world. And he did a series of paintings that year that were all monochronic, monochronic tones of gray. This was known as his gray period. After many years, Picasso was said, uh, said to have said, now I have to work for both of us. And he started infusing the bright, pure colors with a reflection of his inspiration from Matisse. Matisse said an artist has to look at life without prejudice, as he did when he was a child. He wrote in the last years of his life, he said if he loses that faculty, he cannot express himself as an original in a very personal way. His paintings had in them the refinements of color, comfort and pleasure, beautiful furniture, gracing beautiful rooms, the rarest of flowers, mingling with the vague whiff of perfume, painted ceilings, decorative mirrors, the splendor of tranquility, he said. All the world, he said, speaks to our souls in a gentle language of art. In our world, art creates order and beauty. And that's the story of Matisse. These are the works that are at uh, the Cleveland Museum. These are the pieces that we have that are not always on display, unfortunately. Any questions? Yes. Um, when, many years ago, maybe two decades ago, I went to an exhibit at MoMA, and they were, um, yeah, they were in like, um, like a mobile. They were like. The, his cutouts were like hung. Is that huh. is that something he did, or is that um, something that was the way yeah, that was played later? I, I don't. I know he dabbled in sculpture a bit. I don't so remember like hearing much about mobile. I mean, three dimensional. No, I don't remember. But you know, that's not to say I read his letters and I interpret his words, but he may not have mentioned them. I don't really know. I'll have to look into that. Any other questions? Yeah. Would his cutouts? Would he draw them, or, or, or just start cutting? Just start cutting. He would put his ideas on the paper while he laid in bed. Um, very often, the, his uh, assistants would cut those pieces out. But his final work of art was all done freehand. And he would use the positive and the negative of the paper. I don't know if you noticed. You see that little fingered. Uh, a thing showing in color, and then you would see it in, in the, that color, but blank. So he used the positive and negative of both of the pieces. Yes. He said that Emily would, you know, help fund him. So when she left, how was he? Was he wealthy? At that point, he was starting to sell some of his work in England and then in the United States. Interestingly, 
like Monet. France never really accepted him as much as uh, you know other countries did, although he was more accepted than Monet was in France. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm also starting another series at Laurel Lake in February. We're going to do one a month, so if you've missed anything, uh, you might catch it over there. It's open to the public and free as well. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your time. Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing Through the Eyes of the Artist series for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653 2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.